Hello everyone. In the last video we have learned that the gradient is a really central concept in most optimization algorithms. And we have seen that this is the set of partial derivatives of our loss functions with respect to these individual weights. Because knowing the gradient means that we can work with local information only. Right? It has the disadvantage that we can only talk about local optimality. But we have seen that if we find points where this gradient is zero, then these satisfy the necessary condition for optimality, meaning that we can uh, reduce the problem to a set of a few points. And we will come into the next video and, and also to the point that we exclude maxima. And this is much more advantageous than comparing a point w versus all the other possible weights w, right? So having a global criterion saying that w has a smaller loss function or w star, the optimal solution than any other loss function value for, for all other w's is a good way to have a global optimum, but it's computationally basically impossible to really do this. And so here we have the gradient information which helps us without looking at other points, just at the local weight itself. If the derivative or in higher dimensions, the gradient is zero, we know that this point satisfies the necessary condition for optimality. And before we make use of this in points where it's not zero, how to go into directions where we decrease the loss function, let's have a more detailed look at what this, this loss function or what the gradient of the loss function really looks like. Okay, so what we have learned earlier is the, the, the loss function we often look at is the squared loss. Right? So we take the average over all our capital N samples and the loss is then the derivative of our output, uh, the, the, the difference between the output and the input i mapped to our model, and then usually in squared form. All right, and now taking the derivative, you see that this is the derivative or the gradient of all of this. is taking the gradient of this and then the same norm so this is just copy pasting basically h of z i and w and this is now something that is not particularly useful to us but what we can look at is that Taking derivatives is a linear operation and taking sums obviously is also a linear operation. So what you can see is that we can really swap these two things and move the gradient in here. Okay, And this will be very useful um, later on in particular if this capital N becomes very large. Okay, So what I'm going to do now is I'm just saying let's move this inside and say this is 1 over n, the sum from 1 to n over the gradients of this expression here. Okay, so really the gradient of our loss function is the average over the gradient of the individual losses. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use lowercase l to define the individual sample loss, or let's say Li for the ith sample. And what we can now do is simply compute the gradient with respect to one sample, and then take the average over all samples to get the gradient of the loss function on its own. So really what we need to do is uh, to take partial derivatives and then sum them up. Okay? So let's consider one sample first. zi, yi, and look at the gradient for this particular setting. Okay, so what it means is we have to take the gradient of the ith loss function, precisely this expression, and we are now computing the individual entries of this loss function with respect to the jth value. Right? So I can interchange this obviously for, for any j. But this gives me um, 
a particularly simple expression now, because if you look at this, this is basically, we're looking now at a situation where this y is one dimensional, so I could also replace this norm by a bracket. In higher dimensions you can do this too, but it becomes a little more complicated. So consider one, y to be a scalar output, this become brackets, and so taking the derivative with respect to an, a particular w, oh, I missed, yeah, this should be like this, um, taking the derivative requires us to take the chain rule multiple times. Okay, so now let's look at this. What I get is I'm taking the derivative of this, this, this bracket expression first, which gives me two times the bracket, right, yi minus h of vi comma w, right, so the square goes before. And now, as you all know, we need to take the chain rule. This is not the derivative with respect to, to the j's weight yet, but it's the, deriv the derivative with respect of the loss function with respect to the h, and then we need to take the inner derivative, the derivative of h, with respect to w. Okay, so what you see is, first of all, the minus sign will come here. Right, this is just taking the minus outside because there is now the partial derivative times the inner derivative, partial derivative of our model h with respect to the jth value. Okay? So really, really simple if you think about it, it's nothing but taking the chain rule and we will see in particular if you talk about neural networks in the end, we will get a chain rule of many, many, many terms which is known as the backpropagation algorithm. But generically for any model, this is what it looks like. So the first part here comes from the squared loss function. And then we have a part that is really model specific. All right, so let's look at two examples um, before we move on to the next uh, question of how to actually use this gradient for, for getting updates and improving our model. The examples we are considering are first of all a linear model, which is kind of boring if you think about it because we already have a closed form solution, but this is something we know, right? so we can compare against this. And now let's consider a polynomial model It's a linear model with polynomial features. Um, what we had here was the model H of Vi, so the ith input and W, is nothing but the sum of i from 0 to q minus 1, the ith weight, times Zi to the power, oh, excuse me, written in next to j, obviously, the jth weight and the i sample raised to the power of j minus 1. Okay, so this would be w0 plus w1 times zi plus w2 times zi squared and so on until we're at the power j, q minus 1. And so what we've seen now is that this gives us a polynomial model. And what you need to do now is you can simply insert this model specific derivative precisely here. Okay, so what we see now is this gives me, you know, I messed it up a little bit. So let's make this uh, explicit. This is w0 plus w1 times ci plus and so on until we are at w u minus 1 zi to the power of q one, right? So it's q dimensional in the parameter space, but the, because we have this constant term, the maximum exponent is q minus one. So what do we have here? If I take now the derivative with respect to the jth value, so let's say j would be one, then we exactly just get the coefficient, right? So the ith value gives me z to the power of i, okay? So now taking the derivative gives me um, here, the value z, okay, so dl i of w with respect to dwj 
will be simply what I had before, right? Minus two times y i minus h of v i and w multiplied by the jth term, right? And if this is j is one, we have z. If j is two, we have z squared. So this will give me z to the power of j. Okay. So we see here a very nice way to, to calculate the derivative. And as I said, it's a linear model. So we do have a closed form solution. And we will see this in the next video where I also have a, a programming example. And so this is, as we said, this is covered by linear regression. But what you can obviously also have is a model that is no longer linear in W. For instance, consider this also a popular model, the logistic regression problem. There we have our H of Z, I, and W is what we call the, the logistic function, which is the exponential function of W times Z, I divided by one plus the same expression, exponential function of W transposed Z, I. By the way, I'm using a W transposed here. Earlier we have seen W times Z. This is really a bit of a difference in terms of how you define weights. Here I'm interpreting weights as a, a column vector as well as individual feature vectors as column vectors. Right? And so in order to take the inner product, you need the transpose. If you leave it out, well, it's a matter of discussion, right? You know, don't always have to do it. It depends a little bit on how you define W and Z. Here I'm assuming both are column vectors, so I do need the transpose in order to get a scalar value. Okay, but now let's look at this. What we see is that this logistic regression, what this expression gives us, is something like this, where if this argument w transpose z, which is a scalar, and this is between 0 and 1, something like this. So you see, it's a model that varies between 0 and 1 which can often be used in order to have h uh, take the, the, the function of a probability between improbable and probability 1 completely certain. So you see that now the w features in both the denominator and the denominator and also inside an exponential function. So it is clearly not possible to explicitly state um, the, the, the problem in terms of a, a, a solution that we can solve for in one step. But what we need to do is we need to take the derivative of this term and plug it in here into our model specific part. And then we have a gradient that we can evaluate. But we do not obtain a, a system, a linear system even for linear models that we can solve in a closed form solution. And the next video is going to be all about the question how to solve models of this type or find models of this type in an iterative fashion. Thank you.